Yo, it's your boy Logos, and I just finished recording a reaction to Japanese war crimes, and man no oh man, it was dark. So I need something like Tomasa to help, I don't know, pick up my mood after hearing such brutal destruction of potential in life. If you're interested in hearing about it, I have a link down below, but I'll warn you, it's pretty hardcore. But today I want to react to Tomasa debunking myths surrounding the Black American community, and I wonder if it's going to be about racism holding us back and not ourselves because i'm of the opinion that we're capable of doing all the stuff we say we want the wealth the prosperity everything if we just focus on the right values and change our culture i think the culture is a problem not whiteness or other people or the past focus on ourselves focus on what we're capable of and get skills increase our value increase our wealth make smart decisions <laughs> excuse me and I think it'll just be better off for all of us involved. You can't really change anything making excuses or blaming others, but you can you can change things, changing yourself, change your own habits, change your values, and the stuff you uplift. Really don't uplift good stuff in our community. And when we try to do excellence or I don't know, do stuff in school like read, talk, clear, concise English, you call acting right. And it sounds pretty messed up and racist, but these people don't see it that way. They're so ignorant. They think they're actually saying something just right or smart or woke. But let's get into it. Education has played a crucial role in the advancement of blacks over the generations and in the lags of blacks behind others in the American economy. In order to understand both the lags and the advancement, it is necessary to understand the extremely low level from which the education of most black Americans began and the very long time before the great majority of blacks had the kind of education that would qualify them for many of the occupations in which education was essential. Racial discrimination barriers kept educated blacks out of some of these occupations, but until perhaps the middle of the 20th century, there were relatively few blacks to be kept out by such barriers. Looked at differently, the dramatic increases in the numbers of blacks in many professional occupations in the last half of the 20th century cannot be attributed solely, or even primarily, to the removal of these barriers by civil rights legislation. The rise of blacks into professional and other high-level occupations was greater in the years preceding passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 than in the years following passage of that act. What had happened was a dramatic increase in the numbers of blacks with college and postgraduate education. Prior to the First World War, fewer than 5,000 college degrees had been granted to black students in the entire history of the United States. But by 1935, that had increased fivefold, and by 1947, the black colleges alone granted in one year more degrees than blacks had ever received in all the years prior to the First World War. Increases in the numbers of doctorates received by blacks were also dramatic. Similarly, despite a widespread tendency to see the rise of blacks out of poverty as due to the civil rights movement and government social programs of the 1960s, in reality, the rise of blacks out of poverty was greater in the two decades preceding 1960 than in the decades that followed. Education was a major factor in this as well. As of 1940, non-white males averaged just 5.4 years of schooling, compared to 8.7 for white males. Over the next two decades, the absolute amount of education increased for both, and the gap between them narrowed. In 1940, the difference in schooling between black and white young adult males, aged 25 to 29, was four years. But by 1960, that had shrunk to less than two years. Because this was an era of massive black migration out of the South, this quantitative narrowing of the gap in schooling may well have been accompanied by a qualitative improvement, as many blacks left behind the low-quality schools in the Jim Crow South. How did this translate into economic change? As of 1940, more than four-fifths of black families, 87% in fact, lived below the official poverty level. By 1960, this had fallen to 47%. In other words, 
the poverty rate among blacks had been nearly cut in half before either the Civil Rights Revolution or the Great Society social programs began in the 1960s. The continuation of this trend can hardly be automatically credited to these political developments, though such claims are often made, usually ignoring the pre-existing trends whose momentum could hardly have been expected to stop in the absence of such legislation. By 1970, the poverty rate among blacks had fallen to 30 percent, a welcome development, but by no means unprecedented. A decade after that, with the rise of affirmative action in the intervening years, the poverty rate among black families had fallen to 29 percent. Even if one attributes all of this 1 percent decline to government policy, it does not compare to the dramatic declines in poverty among blacks when the only major change was the rise in their education. Whatever the merits of various movements and programs on other grounds, the claim that they were the primary factor in the economic advancement of blacks cannot be squared with the facts. Yet a whole generation of black leaders, intellectuals, and activists had become committed to such movements and programs and their accompanying rhetoric. However, Frederick Douglass warned, as far back as the 1870s, that blacks should cultivate their brains more and their lungs less. While no one can deny the existence of racial discrimination in employment, housing, and other areas, the assumption that the magnitude of employment discrimination can be measured by relative numbers of blacks in particular occupations ignores the huge quantitative and qualitative differences in education between blacks and whites which existed in past generations, often as a result of government discrimination in the provision of educational resources. Without an understanding of the reasons for both the lags and the progress of blacks in the past, policy prescriptions for future advancement risk misplaced emphases. More specifically, it risks underestimating the importance of the quantity and quality of education, which depends upon both students and teachers, and much less on the amount of money fed into education bureaucracies or on the fads and panaceas that come and go in the schools and colleges. While the New England culture that was transplanted into various southern enclaves after the Civil War had remarkable successes, later successful black schools a century later usually had no New England origins, but, like New England, they represented a culture very unlike the black redneck culture. Ralph Ellison has pointed out that such stellar black singers as Paul Robeson and Marian Anderson received their development from an extensive personal contact with European culture free from the influences which shape Southern Negro personality in the United States. For those who are interested in schools that produce academic success for minority students, there is no lack of examples, past and present. Tragically, there has been an utter lack of interest in academically successful black schools by most educators. Among the few who have even bothered to take notice, too many have been as dogmatic as Kenneth B. Clark, who said that excellence at Dunbar represented the few, that Dunbar is the only example in our history of a separate black school that was able, somehow, to be equal, a result of unique circumstances that could scarcely have existed in any other part of the country. Every one of these unsubstantiated claims was demonstrably untrue. One-third of all the black high school students in Washington were not the few, there were, and are, other black schools that met or exceeded national norms, as examples discussed here have shown, and far from being confined to Washington, they have been found from New England to California. Why this ignoring or dismissal of examples of black educational success? Sometimes the reason is ideological. Some, like Professor Clark, have a vested interest in the doctrine that separate is inferior which underpinned the historic Brown v. Board of Education Supreme Court decision, in which his research was cited. To say that mixing and matching racial groups is not a prerequisite for quality education would call into question the decades-long school busing struggle, which might then be seen in retrospect as a costly and divisive wild goose chase, and questions might be raised about the current mantra of diversity. Other reasons for ignoring or downplaying successful black schools include the fact that there is no political mileage or financial benefits to be gotten from focusing on such schools, despite how much of an educational goldmine their experience might be for black children. Put bluntly, failure attracts more money than success. 
politically, failure becomes a reason to demand more money, smaller classes, and more trendy courses and programs, ranging from black English to bilingualism and self-esteem. Politicians who want to look compassionate and concerned know that voting money for such projects accomplishes that purpose for them, and voting against such programs risks charges of mean-spiritedness, if not implications of racism. Ironically, many of the bitter-end defenders of the current public school system and its educational dogmas are also in favor of preferential admissions of minority students to colleges and universities. In other words, having denied minority children an opportunity to develop the kinds of intellectual skills that would make lower admission standards for them unnecessary, they then send minority students on to institutions where they are less likely to meet course standards designed for better prepared students and where most minority students do not last long enough to graduate. During their time on campus, such students help present a photogenic picture of diversity on many campuses, but their roles are much like those of movie extras, who simply provide a background for others. And what you're saying right there, it kind of relates to the whole Supreme Court choosing to not allow colleges use race as like some type of qualifier for admissions. And the point I made in that video when I talked about it was that you can't have students just get into colleges, very hard, high level colleges like Harvard, Yale, such and so forth. If they didn't put the academic effort or the academic background in high school or even leading up to it, maybe like maybe even middle school, if they go that deep or have the good SAT scores to get there, you can't just let them in because they're black. You're not doing them a service. They got to pay for this stuff that go and get loans. And they end up flunking out anyway because they just didn't have the background knowledge, the background effort, or the burning desire to actually be there. If they did, they would have put in the work beforehand. You can't just sign up to one of the hardest schools in the world, even if you're black, white, whatever, and not put in the work, or you just don't care enough. I just never understood why you need to lower the standards for us. If there's a standard, and it's a fair standard for everybody, we need to work hard to get there. It's not like we're not capable. It just seems like our culture doesn't care to emphasize the stuff we need to do. Whether care about BS, like, I don't know, rappers and stuff like that and that lifestyle. And trying to focus on being entertainment and stuff like that instead of knowledge, learning, reading. I love reading growing up. And people will say, why you're acting right and this that, and the other. Just because we had good grades. We talked clearly. We wasn't ignorant. We just, I don't know, just acted like normal everyday people. We wasn't trying to get into no nonsense. We were just being kids. And it's a shame that that's what our culture doesn't like anymore. Hopefully we can change that, but this is what you're talking about. Despite many pious expressions of goodwill and hope for improvements in the education of minority students, few are prepared to do what it takes, including taking on entrenched vested interests in the schools of education, the teachers' unions, and state, local, and national educational bureaucracies. Even fewer are prepared to challenge black students to work harder and abandon the counterproductive notion that seeking educational excellence is acting white. Exactly. Despite the heartening achievements of some black schools, which have repeatedly demonstrated what is possible, even with children from low-income backgrounds, the general picture of the education of black students is bleak. Much of what is said, and not said, about the education of black students reflects the political context rather than the educational facts. Whites walk on eggshells for fear of being called racists, while many blacks are preoccupied with protecting the image of black students rather than protecting their future by telling the blunt truth. It is understandable that some people are concerned about image, about what in private life might be expressed as, what will the neighbors think? But when your children are dying, you don't worry about what the neighbors think. Exactly. When your community is dying, you shouldn't care about what other people think. You need to just fix the issue. You need to stop worrying about letting white people sales like this or white people opinions. You need to just focus on doing the right thing. And I feel like we all know where it is because if it was your kid doing something or if it was the action done to you, you wouldn't like it. Like for example, if you saw your daughter twerking on the table, twerking on the street, you wouldn't like that shit. If it was your mother, you would be embarrassed. But because it's some random person, you think it's cool, you want to scream and yell, say, yeah, go get it, girl, you doing it, yeah. But if it was your daughter, it's like, oh, no, how could you? I'll get my belt on you. Like, 
come on, you know what the standard is, but you want to drop it because people feelings, hot girl summer, let them live their best life. But their best life really isn't their best life. It's just a temporary nice feeling. And it's ridiculous. I, I really don't get it. But they constantly want to complain about the situation and the life they live and this and the other. You really can't blame nobody but yourself. And at the end of the day, that's only way you can fix things. Look at yourself, blame yourself, then come up with a plan and solution and then implement it. Do it so you can be better. Do it so you can have a better life. And we can have a better community. Maybe if we took accountability for what we do, parents, everybody else involved in the community would be better off. Maybe if we didn't, I'm sorry. Maybe if we didn't uphold gang culture, gangster rap and all this other bullshit nonsense we hear on the radios all the time, maybe we wouldn't be where we are. Maybe we wouldn't have gang members always cropping up. We wouldn't have gangs always, I don't know, just coming out of nowhere. They're established or they're getting involved in crime in cities. We wouldn't have young kids dying in the street. We wouldn't have stray bullets hitting people. Maybe we just said that stuff is wrong and we don't like that shit. We're not going to support it. Anybody that does do that stuff is an enemy. Maybe we just said that instead of making excuses or saying that's part of black culture for some idiotic reason. Maybe for some reason we'll be better off. I don't know. I just think the idea of just killing each other, hurting each other, stealing from each other is idiotic. Throwing your money away behind clothes, jewelry, and all this other nonsense. I don't know. Up somebody, stud on somebody. Instead of investing it on yourself, your business, your community, it just makes more sense to me. I really just don't get with the stuff that we try to uphold or the stuff that we say is what makes you black. Like what you said about out the acting right. What I said about acting right. I did a whole video about the whole acting right thing we have going on in the black community. Where doing good, positive, enriching, I don't know, developmental stuff is called acting right. Where acting ignorant, stupid, and getting involved in crime is keeping it real it's so stupid and idiotic and i think it's pathetic and people still push it i really don't take those people ser those people seriously in regards of you're supposed to be some type of influencer some type of advisor some somebody i'm supposed to look up to if you uphold the killing of other black men selling drugs robbing niggas any of that stupid ignorant shit i just think you're an idiot <laughs> just being blunt with you that's why I like Kevin Samuels. That's why I like Jordan Pearson. That's why I like Debbie Goggins. They actually talk about real stuff and they make sense. They ain't just trying to keep it real, keep it hard all the time. Now, all that stuff is bullshit. Nobody cares about you trying to keep it real. We have kids. We have young adults. We have innocent people dying in the street over nothing. And it's so idiotic and stupid that we don't have the time, I don't know, for people that make excuses for it. At the end of the day, people are dying. People are suffering. And we're holding ourselves back. That's just how I see it. I really think if we just had ourselves together, fix our culture, fix our values, fix our standards, we'd be better off. We don't have to ask for people for handouts. We already got it. We don't need to ask. But that's just me. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. It's your boy Logos, and I'll see you next time. Peace.